Today we have uh, with us Ken Forbus, who is a professor of computer science at Northwestern University. Uh, Ken um, received his degrees from MIT and he has uh, shown interest or, or part of his interest in our cognition, qualitative reasoning and user interaction. That's why, um, that's why I think uh, that, that is particularly interesting for, for ISGO, right? Where we have always this educational aspect very present in mind. And the, the, we, we are inviting Ken because, because well, uh, I first met him in KCAP where he gave a keynote about precisely these topics. Uh, so I'm very, very interested to see what he has uh, to tell us today. So please, Ken, go ahead. We can't hear you right now. Yeah, I think yeah, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Yes, I love video conferencing. It's always <laughs> so amazingly wonderful. Um, so what I want to tell you about is some work that we did as part of our NSF Center in collaboration with geoscientists. So um, in fact, you'll see as soon as the slide pops up. Come on, you can do it now. Can you see the slide? Yes, good. Sure. Um, so, so as you'll notice, the author list has a bunch of people, and with the exception of Maddie Usher and Matt McClure, the rest are geoscience people. So this really is a, a joint project. We're looking at how you can use sketch understanding in geoscience education. This was part of the Spatial Intelligence and Learning Center and NSF Science and Learning Center that had a good 10-year run, and this is one of the, one of the main products we generated out of SILT. So, if you think about geoscience and sketching, we did a survey, actually, of 72 geoscience instructors, and over 80% of them say that sketching is very important for understanding geological concepts. If you look at that graph, you'll see, oh my god, it's important, okay? Now, if it's important, you might think it gets used a lot in classrooms, but those of you who teach geoscience are probably thinking to yourself, well, yeah, but, but, but it's but not my classroom as much as I'd like to. And in fact, less than half assign sketches more than three times per semester. And, and the reason is grading them is hard. So grading efficiency matters. In addition to grading efficiency, there's also giving students detailed feedback. So if you think about intelligent tutoring systems in other fields, one of the things they do is give in feedback anytime, anywhere. The student doing their homework at 3 a.m. the night before it's due, you can't be in their dorm room, but the software can be, okay. And so we're, we've made it so that A, we can provide such feedback, and B, do so automatically, and three, with things authored by geoscientists and discipline scientists without AI people in the loop. That's very important for dissemination and scalability. So that's our motivation. I'll tell you about CogSketch, which is our platform for open domain sketch understanding. Then I'll tell you about sketch worksheets, how we build them and how they work. And I'll talk about two experiences in deploying them, one in geoscience classes, the other in AI and cognitive science classes, and tell you where we're going next with this. So, CogSketch has two roles. It's first of all a cognitive science research instrument. It's trying to be a model of high level visual and spatial representations and reasoning. By that I mean things like geometric analogies. The first example on the left is an example of a geometric analogy problem. A is to B as C is to, and if you think about it, you'll probably all come up with the same answer, which is three. And if you download CogSketch, um, which will run on any Windows machine, you'll find a complete set of geometric analogy problems from work by Tom Evans back in the 1960s. These have the feature that CogSketch correctly predicts human reaction time differences across these problems. In the middle is an example of an oddity task. You're asked to say which is the odd one out, which is different from the others in some way. The researchers who did this in a science article did it with Americans and Munduruku and showed there were differences between the two groups. The CogSketch model actually operates at human level. 
what's hard for the model is hard for people and vice versa. And by doing ablation studies on the model, obviously not the people, um, we can actually explain some of those cross-cultural differences. The third example, the one on the right, is an example of the kind of problem you see in Raven's regressive matrices. In cyclometrics, Raven's is the most sorry, the most accurate predictor of human fluid intelligence. So uh, the Raven's model for Cog Sketch again predicts human difficulty levels and it operates at the 76th percentile. So it's better than most adult Americans at doing this task. So we are capturing something important about the way humans are reasoning about visual things. And that gives us the ability to make a new kinds of educational software that understands sketches in the way people do. So on the left, you see something that's helping students figure out how to do engineering design by helping to explain their designs. And on the right, you'll see an example of sketch worksheets an example from a geoscience class that I'll uh, go a little bit more into in a, just a few minutes. Now, the thing about sketching is when most people think about sketch understanding, they think about recognition. But recognition is, is such a tiny part of sketch understanding. So when people have built educational software systems that use sketching before, they've done recognition. And that means they don't work very well. So each system works in only one small part of a single domain. So there's systems that do chemistry, but it's a particular kind of chemical diagram they can do. Or they do electronic circuits, and they do just electronic circuits, and in some cases, particular kinds of electronic circuits, analog versus digital. And so you have to train a new system for every new subpart of every domain. Now, that's kind of problematic. Because if you think about most STEM domains, geoscience being a wonderful example, most STEM domains involve more than just abstract visual symbols. So this is a fold to the fault, and you'll see that someone has inked them up on top of the photograph, which is a fairly common exercise. And the shape of those things isn't something you would recognize per se, right? There's lots of things that have those shapes. The mapping between concepts and how they're depicted is many to many. That means recognition can never, ever work at scale in STEM domains. So the other thing you have to do is, especially dealing with students, you have to have them label what they draw. So on the right, you see someone has labeled the thing which is the fold, the fault, and vice versa. So even if they draw it correctly and you accurately match the shapes, if you don't know their intended meaning, then you can't know if they actually understand what they drew. So that's why what we do is something very, very different. In CogSketch, we do what we call open domain sketch understanding. So when you look at people sketching, they talk. They verbally identify what they're drawing and that means recognition isn't a necessity. It's a catalyst. It's very convenient when you have it, but it's not something that you have to have because you can simply say what it is you mean. So our trick in cock sketch is we draw glyphs to depict things and you, it's really flat footed. You start drawing some ink and when you're done, you press the finish click button and you can edit it and regroup things and stuff like that. But if you think about the heuristics that people have used to do segmentation in the past, long pauses or bringing the pen up, those are both things that happen all the time if you're thinking about something. It doesn't mean you're necessarily through drawing the thing you started to draw. The glyphs can be anything Cogsitch has a concept for. And we have a large knowledge base that has hundreds of thousands of different concepts including now a number of geoscience concepts. So you tell Cog Sketch what a glyph means by labeling them. So what it does is not segmentation or recognition, but it, as we saw before, it's modeling aspects of human visual and spatial representations of reasoning. The idea is for Cog Sketch to see our sketches as we see them. And that turns out to be important if you're gonna give people feedback. So, Here's the kinds of things that are glyphs. 
So a glyph combines both ink and what it represents. This is from an early worksheet done in Brad Sageman's class for the carbon cycle. You notice there's entity glyphs representing objects. So the ocean is an object here, and that's an example of an entity glyph. Relation glyphs describe relations. Here, it's a flow of carbon dioxide from the ocean to the atmosphere. And annotation glyphs provide additional information. So there's 750 petatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, according to this sketch. So it's a very flexible visual language. Um, now, what CogSketch does with this is basically all sorts of visual computations that are very human-like. So suppose you drew something like this, two circles and a square. Well, at the object level, it knows these are three different distinct objects, but it can also group them based on similarity to say, well, those two round things are probably the same in the same category, and the square thing's probably the same. If you do something like drawing a stack of cubes, then CogSketch actually carves that up into a set of edges and junctions, and then turns those into edge cycles, and then identifies whole objects. So it's basically constructing the things out of which you would build surfaces and a visual basis. The citations at the bottom are particular pieces of the vision science literature that we use to help us motivate these particular representations. Now it does a bunch of other cool things as well. So there's qualitative topology. Do things overlap or it's one thing inside the other? These get used a lot in geoscience. There's groupings that something's inside something else or things are touching around the edge of something. Uh, Voronoi diagrams are a way of measuring adjacency so that, for example, if you're representing the relative positions of parts of a cat, you would say, well, the one eye is to the left of the other and they're both above the nose, but you wouldn't, for instance, uh, particularly represent the, one of the eyes with one of the whiskers because they're not adjacent to each other. And finally, there's shape decomposition. So you can carve something up into edges and that gets used, for example, to model lymph rotation using representations for edges that were come from the vision science community to label them in terms of concave, convex, and other sorts of representations. So it's doing quite a lot of visual processing under the hood, far beyond anything that you see in a recognition-based system. Now, sketch worksheets. So sketching is a great way of learning spatial relations. This is from a greenhouse example that Andrew Jacobson at Northwestern gives every final exam in his intro class. Students mostly get it wrong. This really annoys him because uh, he tells them it's going to be on the exam, right? And yet, uh, nevertheless. So if you give people pencil and paper examples, unless the instructor and or the T are really on the ball, they do not get feedback in a timely fashion. And they certainly don't get it in real time. Um, one horror story and structure, an instructor shall remain nameless. Uh, not a geoscientist in this case, um, and not a computer scientist. Um, we've had other users. Um, they turn in their pencil and paper sketches the second week of class for some engineering design exercises. They don't get feedback until the last week of class. Pretty clearly, you're not learning anything there. So, Cog Sketch, you press the feedback button and it gives you feedback. So, this is an example of feedback. And if you download Cog Sketch, you can try this very worksheet out and see how it's built. So, the key thing is that Sketch worksheets are built by instructors. That means that anyone can pick up the software and go through the tutorials and experiment with it a bit and learn how to build worksheets and tweak worksheets other people have built. So here's what's inside. Uh, the, the teacher draws a teacher sketch. This is Bridget Garnier. She's one of the co-authors here and she was a grad student at University of Wisconsin-Madison working for Basil Teakoff. She authored a complete set of geoscience introductory course worksheets. Now she draws Cox sketch analyzes, and the author marks what facts are important and adds some grading rubrics. So if this is, is true, you get this many points. By the way, if it's not true, say this. Now, it's important that we're letting the instructor say what's going to be said, because if you try to have the AI system do it, 
how does the AI system know what your students are like, what natural language they use, grade level, etc. So putting it in the instructor's hands means they can control that. Now, this gets passed out maybe by email, maybe by a course management system. The student does their solution. Now, in the instructor sketch is hidden from the student, of course, password protected. And now Cogsage analyzes it. Because it's the same visual system doing the analysis, it can compare them using a model of human anal analogy. This model of human analogy, by the way, is super general. It was used in all of the visual problem solving projects you saw before. It's been used for modeling textbook problem solving in physics and thermodynamics. It's been used to model moral decision making. It's a, re it's a truly general model of human analogical reasoning. Now, given the comparison, it takes those differences and some tutoring rules to give advice based on the important facts and the advice that the instructor gave. That advice gets fed back to students. Now, being a computer naturally, it has stored all the keystrokes, all the ink, all the timing data, all the times the student has feedback button, and that material is passed back to the instructor for assessment purposes. We, we, you can and we have made things that go analyze these things, cluster them, look for patterns among the data. So um, here's an example of coaching from a fault worksheet. So you have the instructor sketch on the left, the student sketch on the right. And um, so here's the hanging wall in the instructor sketch. Here's the hanging wall in the student sketch. Those differences are then going to provide suggestions like, have you maybe something vague, like have you considered where the hanging wall is or something more targeted, depending on, on what you want to say. So analogical matching is a very flexible way of doing authoring. So if you don't mark a fact as important, it can vary. And that means you're ignoring irrelevant spatial aspects. To show you just how flexible this is, here is a complete solution, complete and correct solution, to the greenhouse effect worksheet, okay? This is also a solution. This was done by an NSF program manager um, who wasn't a geoscientist, but with the software's help, the, they managed to make it through. You notice that we didn't require the planet to be a ball. We didn't require the atmosphere to be something around the planet, all right? We could take a different perspective and it would be fine. And here's also a solution to this worksheet because all it cares about are that there are the appropriate entities and what kinds of relationships hold among them. And so the thing is by specifying what facts are important, the instructor is putting down what they mean. Now, geoscience is very spatial, so sometimes it's really crucial to nail down particular spatial relations. That's why we have the idea of drawing on a background, for instance, a photograph, and the idea of quantitative ink constraints. So if the instructor draws this fault and these marker beds and the directions of shift in their sketch, they want to give feedback saying, well, okay, they can have the ink a little off, but not too far off, and quantitative ink constraints let you do that. So the author draws the desired outline and then indicates error tolerances. So there's a marker bed. You see it's pretty broad. And then the advice can be based on directions of difference as well as things that don't overlap. So this lets you actually do all sorts of fun things. So this is from an engineering design worksheet where um, the software is being used hierarchically. So it takes one description and if it finds something to complain about at the most abstract description, it then goes and gives you that feedback. Otherwise, it'll further visually decompose things recursively. So we, we needed that in engineering design worksheets. We never needed it in geoscience, interestingly enough. That may or may not be true of geoscience more broadly, but certainly for the intro courses, none of the worksheets that Bridget and Basil did had any of that. So the 26 worksheets that covered all the topics for introductory geoscience were designed to cover the main kinds of topics in an intro geology class and they're also publicly available so for instance if you have a class an intro class download cog sketch download these worksheets from circ at carlton 
and have a blast. You know, you can you can experiment with them, you can do stuff with them, use them as is, whatever you like. Now, um, authoring. Well, it's about three days development time per worksheet in steady state. In the beginning, it took longer because they're figuring out what can you really do with the system? What's easy, what's hard? There's a little bit of consult with one of my grad students, but Bridget did all the authoring. That's really important. 75% um, of the time was materials development. That's Bridget and Basil's estimate. So in other words, not having to do anything with the software, just saying, here's what I'm trying to do, here's my example, what's that gonna look like? And so software versus pencil and paper, 75% of the work is the same. Now grading efficiency. Bridget decided to really go all out. She made paper versions and cog sketch versions that were closely matched. And she did the grading for both sets of students. So on paper, about a minute and a half per worksheet to grade. She's really fast. Um, but cog sketch was a lot faster, right? 0.11 minutes per worksheet. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I <laughs> I did this once for a uh, group at a spatial cognition conference, and two people who had been who are now in the oil industry who had been TAs at ASU, where there's like hundreds of students in the class, said plaintively, "Where were you when we needed you?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so Northwestern, the instructor there, Wayne Marco, basically did this as, as labs. And so he basically wanted them to score at least 70% on the worksheet given cog sketches rubric. And then he would do pass fail manually grading. So for him, it was only 0.4 minutes. But again, only 0.4 minutes because he never got anything that was totally wacky that you couldn't understand. It was crazy um, because of that, that pre-filter. Now, one of the things that can go wrong um, is the shoemaker's kids go barefoot. So I teach a knowledge representation class and I actually use sketch worksheets there. So here you're looking at the idea of conceptual structure. It's got organisms which can be plants or animals. And animals can be carnivores. And you'll notice that there's a bit of complaining here because it says, although rare, there are carnivorous plants and you can fix it just by moving that plant so it's partially overlapping <laughs> the carnivore box. And then cog sketches happen. <laughs> now, this is a, a truly nasty example. Um, it's about a soap opera where Leo is murdered at a gymnasium with a candlestick. That's the upper left part. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy um, desires to murder Leo. <laughs> so that green circle is actually the desire of Kathy to have something happen. But of course, that doesn't mean that's the actual murder. Now, why does Kathy want to kill Leo? Well, because she blames Leo for the murder of her twin sister. Okay, so soap operas are a great grist for, for dealing with knowledge representation. Now, this is a hard problem to formally represent. And, and so students on average made 40 requests for feedback each in doing this worksheet. But by doing that, 78% of them got a perfect score. Perfect. I mean, dear God, we need this by hand. They're so far from perfect, it's like laughable, right? Um, now, for a similarly complex worksheet, in fact, frankly, a little simpler, um, we turn feedback off because there's something broken about feedback and bad feedback is worse than no feedback. Only 38% got a perfect score. Mm -hmm. The feedback really is helping them towards mastery. We've also done this with students who are, are much more naive. The Intro to Cognitive Modeling class, over half the students have never installed an application on their computer, let alone programmed it. And yet they can handle things like building a concept map representation of little sentences like Barack Obama gave a speech in Northwestern today, or a kind of causal model um, using qualitative process theory on how um, the greenhouse effect works. And so um, that's, this is actually one of the prettier ones, but uh, basically everybody got it. 
so you can take causal arguments and turn them into concept maps and give students feedback on that, which is really, really useful. So where are we going with this? Well, okay, so Windows is fine, Windows is great, and the author, you still need a Windows box. But we also understand people want to use iPads, Chromebooks, whatever. Um, but we're not going to make Cogsense run native on those because, frankly, it's just way too hard. Um, but what we have is a cloud-based version. So the interface is HTML5. We have Docker-based server instances. And as of this, as of last month, we now have a version that runs on Amazon's cloud. So if you really, really want to do it that way, and for instance, you have Canvas as a course management system, you can have Canvas do the authentication, students do sketch worksheets, turn them in, it gets turned into Canvas automatically. Um, you can download into the Cog Sketch gradebook. And so all you have to do is um, grab our stuff and give Amazon your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not paying for the clouds for everybody. Sorry, we can't do that. <laughs> We, we, barely, we barely can afford to do the development. Um, we're also doing an open source release. So the binary has been freely available now for like six or seven years, uh, but we want to make it uh, a truly open source. So there's a lot of clean open documentation to do there. Now, it's only going to help you if you love common lists because that's what it's written in. Um, we do have some friends in industry who are eager to build an open tool chain version and God knows what they'll choose to do it in. That's not, that's not what we do. Um, and so that's what um, we'll let them figure out. And we're also integrating with other tutoring systems. We have a cognitive architecture called Companions that has natural language capabilities and a whole lot more reasoning abilities. And so we're now building tutors based on, on Companions that also allow you to use sketch and language understanding. So that's, that's the story. Any questions? Thank you. That's fantastic. It's um, fascinating. So I, I do have a question. So um, I remember when I went uh, with a field trip with with Cube that um, most of the scientists, well, they do a sketch on their on their notebooks. So um, have you considered like using your software also to un automatically understand what? people are sketched on their not in the, their lab notebooks because that would be great in terms of like to to start transforming all this information into useful knowledge graphs so so there's there's several answers to that um, the simple answer is no <laughs> um, the more complex answer is I mean the more real answer is um, ink is fundamentally different than pixels. And so if you have a way of doing ink capture, so for instance, um, you're using an S Pen on a Wacom device or an Apple Pencil on an iPad or a Surface Pen on a, a Microsoft Surface machine, you can capture real digital ink in applications like OneNote and that can be sucked into Cog Sketch and processed. Um, we haven't done it. We're, we're going to do that with OneNote, in fact. Um, like I use OneNote and Ink all the time on my Samsung phone. Um, works fine. Uh, there's, we have done work on using real live vision, like uh, image processing to construct representations for things. Um, and that's just harder. It's harder because you don't know what the strokes are. So it's doable, but there's a lot more work there. And so it's going to be a lot noisier. I when, so when someone is building their first um, rubric, so they need to basically sketch their own solution and then identify whether it's an object or um, a real, let's see, I forget the different, there were three different um, categories. Um, but they've got to, they've got to manually tell you then this is what, there's a relationship here with an object and then they write in text what their relationship is. I'm just wondering how you compose a rubric basically. How do you? 
uh, compose a rubric or the, the solutions? Okay, so you compose a solution by, by drawing glyphs and labeling them and picking the right kinds of glyphs and labels. So for example, in the um, greenhouse effect worksheet, Mm -hmm. um, the place to start there is to draw the entities and then draw the um, relationship arrows that describe the flows. Right. And so and w as an author, you have access to all the concepts in the knowledge base. And that, that can be a huge number. There's English language search facilities. And if there's not something that you, that you find in there that you need, then you can always add it yourself. Um, one of the so Cox Sketch is designed to run in low-end classrooms as well as on nice machines. So, like, there's a version that'll still run on 32-bit Windows. <laughs> so, so everything is menu-driven in the authoring environment. Um, we are, for the companion-based version, um, full natural language understanding. You say the name. Does it know the concept? Then you may go into a clarification dialogue, right? So there you've got the luxury of being able to do that. Uh, but we didn't have the luxury for something that's got to be super scalable. Mm -hmm. um, then it's it's looking at the facts. So there's the, the two the two pain points is figuring out where to make the, where, how to find the right hooks into the ontology. Mm -hmm. And the second is um, looking through the facts and saying, oh yes, this is the fact I need in order to get across the concept I have. And so there's, there's, um, there's a slight art to that. That's why the, the time to author dropped from a week and a half to um, a couple of days. And, and there's a set of patterns that you learn. So for instance, a, a good pattern is um, I'm going to mark up a photograph and I'm going to, or I'm going to mark up a graph or a diagram. And so then I can use all sorts of quantitative constraints to help constrain what it is I need for a good solution. A really bad pattern, which I strongly disrecommend, is um, things involving Zoom. Someone had the idea of saying, well, I'm going to get across the idea of different time scales in paleontology by having the person zoom in and try to find something. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I mean, so, so that's, zooming is something that's very hard to do well, no matter what's happening. It's imagining that you're gonna do zooming well in ink that someone's drawn pretty arbitrarily. No, it's not mm -hmm. gonna happen, right? So, so basically, once we led them through that and, and realized, I mean, and then, then, then they articulated, well, they really want them to be as frustrated by how hard it is because of the big differences. And it's like, let's think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you want them to be frustrated and pissed off. Is that kind of help of learning? <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> you know, you do, you take two things and then you annotate them and you, sh the annotation can capture that humongous difference very nicely. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Are there any other questions? Um, well, I just wanted to say very quickly, uh, thank you very much, Ken. And, and I may need to leave because I need to run to another meeting. But thanks. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very, very nice. That was fascinating. I'm still adjusting it all. Yeah, me too. And I, it'll be nice. I'm glad we have this recorded. This is Mary Hill. I'm glad we have this recorded and um, I may be bugging you. <laughs> Are there any core papers that we can cite or viewers? Could you send us like just a few references of the core papers if we want to write an education paper again and want to bring this in? Yeah, if you just Google cog sketch, um, if you get something that says dog sketch, ignore it. It's not us. <laughs> I see it here. I'm on the page. And um, so I just, so we could just kind of uh, explore it looks like and we can download it to a Windows machine. Yep. I don't have a Windows machine, but I'll figure something out. We have some virtual machines in places that maybe we could set up. Yeah, you can, you can, they're pretty easy to borrow these days. Yeah. <laughs>
so the craziest thing people have run them on, there was an experiment in a fifth grade classroom where all they had were the old black plastic MacBooks mm -hmm. running a Windows emulator. <laughs> so drawing on a trackpad. Wow. Now, now kids actually, in some cases, are faster and more fluent drawing on a trackpad or mouse than I am with pens. Mm -hmm. So that may not have been a handicap for them, but it is, is by far the, the saddest platform anywhere. <laughs> uh, by the way, the, the analysis by some learning scientists showed that the kids actually did better on two out of three pre-post tests in the unit on the circular list. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even, even that was fine. It's really interesting. It's, it, so I, I'm really grateful that you gave this presentation because all the time I try to emphasize to geoscientists that AI is more than machine learning. And they always ask, well, what else is it? And I've always said, well, reasoning is one of the things. And I know that because of working with Yolanda, but this is a really beautiful, concrete example that I can point them to to yeah. say, go, go look at CogSketch, and then you'll understand it's much more than just machine learning or feature recognition from... We worked hard to make sure there were a number of, that the, A, there were interactive tutorials, and two, nice things you could do out of the box. Mm -hmm. So there's sketch worksheets, there's a couple of design coach examples. Design coach is nowhere near as well developed as sketch worksheets. Sketch worksheets are really robust, stable, we use them regularly. You know, they just work. Um, but also some of the simulation examples. So so the funny part about geometric analogies is um, I was giving a talk at a hedge fund and uh, and one of the hedge fund people said, So so how many training examples did that take? And and, and my answer was zero. It's like it just understands. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, there's Very nice. If you really look at cognitive science, there's a lot of great things you can do. And learning is fine, but you also would like, you know, the, the complaint about neural models back in the 80s was they couldn't learn in the lifetime of the organism. Mm -hmm. And that's still true today, right? So the talk, the talk is about data efficiency. So it's true, if you're Google and you want to do machine translation, and you can get billions of parallel corpora, what the hell, right? Right. Um, that's great, that's great. But if you wanna build, for instance, a software system that's gonna work with you and keep up with you, and you're giving it some new tasks, you really don't wanna give it 100,000 examples, right? Or even 100 examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's an area of AI called interactive task learning. Mm -hmm. It's all about instructing machines to do things for you, but with human numbers of examples in natural modalities. Mm -hmm. Training data, just the two of you working it through. Oh, interesting. And that's where the future lies. Nice. Oh, that's interesting. Really? Okay, anything else? Any other comments or, or thoughts? Fascinating is all I can say. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. We appreciate thanks that you so took the time to give this presentation. Okay, you, pla you, you planted a seed here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. With a good group of people. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.